Okay, well, th thank you. And by the way, thank you for coming to for attending. It's a it's a award for us, you know, to see uh, a people of your level to come to our summer school. So, um, so Giuseppe, we are ready. Uh, let me just announce you. So to all our online uh, participants, uh, we're going to do first the block um, of about one hour, uh, where uh, Giuseppe Matuli and myself, we're going to introduce you to the content of the two uh, blocks in the morning and the afternoon. And so you get, uh, without mistake, you know in which room you have to go. So I will start with uh, uh, Giuseppe. Uh, he's connected and the uh, microphone is on, video is on. Um, yes, we are, we are on, you're ready to go. Please uh, keep it to uh, half an hour, best uh, 20 minutes, 25 minutes, so we can still ask some questions. Okay, everybody. And first of all, thanks, Tom, to organizing also to invite me for this uh, amazing uh, summer school. And also good for me to uh, to have another point of view of the summer schools that I also running in geo computation. Uh, so they, during my um, four hour exercise, I'm going to talk about the GDAL OGR MPK tools for massive raster vector operation. Uh, these are amazing tools. Probably most of you heard the first one, GDAL and OGR also, that they have API interface with, um, with R, with the R GDAL uh, binding, but also PK tools is the brother, let's say, of GDAL, it has been implemented uh, close by uh, from, um, from Peter Kempner, a, 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 a colleague and also a friend of mine uh, that is working at the GRC. Um, concerning myself, I'm a research scientist at um, Yale University in the School of Environmental Study and also in the Center for Research Computing. I'm also um, the founder of SpatialEcology.net. Actually, we, um, I found that uh, many years ago, 15 years ago, when me and Tom, we were working together at the GRC. And also, I am implementing the teaching material, the DocuWiki, uh, through my learning phase, not only for the summer school, but even in the beginning for myself, uh, because I realized that, especially when we start 20 years ago, the, the material for uh, teaching geocomputation uh, was not so much available. So I was learning and writing in the same time um, the special college .net doku wiki. Um, so concerning this talk, Okay, um, I'm going to talk about briefly about my background, let's say how I evolved my skills in, uh, in geocomputation. Then I will focus on what you can do with the GDAL MPK tools um, in the framework of geocomputation and mainly into uh, main subject, the ge global geomorphometric layers that I released last year and the global hydrological modeling that is an ongoing project. And that I will also talk about the data flow and the language integration that I try to emphasize um, for massive, massive geographic data process in the HPC framework. Uh, so a bit about myself. I studied forestry in Italy uh, during my master. Um, and then I come actually over here in the Netherlands, Wageningen. And I follow the first master in Europe in geographic information time, is science. This was uh, 20 years ago, uh, so the time has been fly, and over there I start to uh, learning about all the uh, GIS and remote sensing uh, application uh, in the spatial science. Uh, from there I moved to my PhD, it was uh, a combination in Spain, Netherlands and Italy, and over there I start to emphasize 
the, unis, uh, the, uh, the use of Linux and Bash and even Oak. At the moment, 15 years ago, we were working with a uh, half giga RAM. So R was really, it was there. They were not packaged for GDA, uh, for special science. And they, you were going to be able to enter on, only with the tables. Okay, so we, um, I did a lot of pre-processing with the mainly Linux, Bash, uh, Oak. Oak is for processing text file. Then I moved to, to GRC for the postdoc and over there, uh, even the RAM become bigger in the meantime. So I start to use R, Python, Grass, and GDAL and PK tools. When, when I moved to nine, eight years ago, when I moved to United States at Yale University, I started to use intensely with the HPC that they have for massive data process. And of course, like uh, Richard Barnes was say, you have to use, even if you have an HPC, you have to code in properly in order to have the maximum power of HP. If you have HPC, it's not an unlimited power and, and time and, and size. So also, so better you program in, in a more better efficient language, better you, you, you do your performance. Um, and then in the meantime, like I mentioned, I was uh, founded the Spatial Ecology.net and I ran International Summer School in Matera in geocomputation using open free, uh, free open source software where we focus not only in R, actually R, I, uh, I, did, I do not emphasize so much because it's been covered mainly by, uh, by Tom, uh, some schools also because several universities already have course, but we focus more in Linux, in BAS, in GDAL and GRASS, and then use the R for the machine learning and for the statistical computation. Um, so now we go into the topic, what we can do it with GDL and PK tools and between brackets, I say also grass because some part I, uh, I did in grass and we can see mainly two subjects, uh, the geomorph for 90 meter that I'm going to talk right away. And then the global monitoring of fresh water. Um, this is a project that has been running for two years. Um, and now you can see the full publication in scientific data, in uh, nature scientific data, and has been released one terabyte of data set. So, um, so what are the geomorphom uh, geomorphometric layers? Um, so uh, as you see, as you know, the landscape and the digital elevation model uh, is really capturing all the different geomorphometric layers that mm -hmm. are driven microclimate and microclimate pattern in, uh, on the earth. And of course, they are influencing uh, species distribution, animal movement, um, population density, and so on and so on. And chemistry value uh, for in the soil and also in, uh, in the water. So, but how we can capture these different shape? Okay, so this is the science behind, is the geomorphometry, is the science that is study this shape of uh, feature. So uh, we can mainly study the geomorphometry uh, into different uh, uh, type. Let's say the roughness, that is the, the roughness of the surface. So the up and down, let's say how much is uh, rough the, the surface. So there are several index to identify this roughness. So more is roughness, more the higher is the index and more is flat and less is the index is close to zero or so. And then there are different kinds of curvature that are nothing else than the second derivative of the slope um, of the digital elevation model. So it's the derivative of the slope. Um, so in this case, you can see that uh, different relief, they, they, can, they can be convergence or divergence in the different direction. So in the horizontal direction, in the, ver in the vertical direction, horizontal direction, and so on. So this allow you to identify different curvature that of course, then helping in the species distribution modeling or different kind of modeling, several factors. For example, you can imagine that these one are main prone to concentrate water inside to the valley and, and in the concavity. And then of course are, um, are especially important for species distribution in the plant science because they will have more water, more biomass, and also for example in uh, forest fire because it will be more fuel, but that fuel maybe will not be so dry like in condition over here where they are missing of water. So all these uh, features that can be captured in index 
Um, so, and then for example, we can have different kinds of roughening surface. Uh, so this is, uh, is the product of one of the first products coming from the, I use it as a dam, the merit dam, that is, uh, is, um, is derived directly derived from the SRTM. So is a corrected digital elevation model uh, where Dai Yamazaki, a brilliant scientist from Japan, has been removed all the different, mainly, not all, but most of them, all the errors present in the SRTM. So it's very uh, well done, uh, seamless um, uh, digital elevation model that actually, honestly, I was running several computations, so I didn't find gap in the model, so in, in the digital elevation model. So it's really promising for use it in a large scale like I did. Uh, and so on, we, we can have different index. So this is one of the roughness, but then we can have also um, roughness index and, and so on. And uh, so this is just to show you uh, one of them. Um, then, then, for example, the curved surface, as you can see, we can have profile curvature and tangential curvature, like I mentioned, in according to the difference um, to the different direction of the second derivative that we calculate. And um, the combination between roughness and uh, curvature surface giving us the, the so-called geomorphological landform. So for example, over here, you can see, it's quite small, but anyway, over here, they, you can see the ship, even if you cannot read, but you can see the different peak edge and the different shape of the, of the geomorphological landform, how they can, can be mapped and how they are different in terms of concentration in, uh, um, percent, in, in percentage, percentage in the different part of the world. So uh, all these data set at the moment are, um, are at 90 meter resolution. That's why it's called more for 90 meter in the um, open topography. Open topography is another really nice source. It's, um, um, or organization based in the United States, but is collecting the, uh, digital elevation model and LIDAR data from all over the world. So uh, they were able to hosting. And for me, it was quite challenging to find someone hosting one terabyte of data because of course the, the journal, they have like Figshare or uh, some other little, uh, I mean, big company that are providing sharing data, but not one tera. They, you can do mass, maximum one, one giga, uh, sorry, 100 giga. So open, open to poker, open their server to, uh, to hosting the data. Uh, but and over here, you can download all the data and, um, and you, but unluckily, they, they didn't have a really nice visualization tools. Um, then, therefore, I contact Tom to be able to, um, to be ingested inside, uh, um, inside openlandmap.org. So the developer that are working with Tom, they did a really a great job in, um, in, in the, this rendering is really one of the most fastest, actually is the fastest WebGIS that I saw, really amazing. And over here you can, you can check is under relief. You can check the different geomorphometric index. So for example, compound, this is another topographic index, another roughness index. Then you have this one quite, uh, quite appealing. The multi-scale deviation is also very nice in terms of color. Um, so pay attention that this one has been resampling it to 250 meter to allow the fast rendering. So if you download from here, you will have a 250 meter um, variable. Uh, so this one, this WebGIS is more for visualization. So we emphasize in the fast rendering. So that's why we could not uh, upload the 90 meter. Anyway, we are, we are talking with Tom uh, to upload also the 90 meter and also the stream network process that I'm going to talk. Um, so the second project that I did mainly with the GDAL, PK tools and also GRASS, that is an ongoing project. So is the global monitoring of fresh water at high spatial temporal resolution. Also this one is a 90 meter resolution. We are going to estimate the discharge, so meter cubic per second in all the river in the globe. Uh, at monthly years level. Um, and we are uh, forecasting the producing of 30 terabytes of data set. So uh, 30 times the geomorphometric layers, let's say, in terms of size. Um, 
So this one you can see the uh, you can see the um, the details of this project for people that are really into the hydrological modeling. I did a talk at NASA, a GPL and NASA last year. So you can go in there and check in really the, the details of the science behind. Um, so the, the water cycle is very complex, as you can imagine, you heard from your ecology background. And, but I'm concentrating my, my attention in the stream flow, okay? So the amount of water, again, that is passing through the um, uh, the, each single stream. And yesterday, uh, Lun Zhu Shen, my colleague, was um, presenting the, um, the chemistry of the water, uh, biochemistry of the water, but in, and in the same framework, so in a machine learning framework, um, we, are going to, um, um, we are going to implement this, uh, this, kind, this project. So what we need for, uh, for implementing a machine learning in the, in the freshwater analytics. Uh, we need gauge station, like in the same concept of uh, uh, Tom need the point of observation for soil. Um, we need a global watershed and stream network. So we need to know where the stream are because uh, we need, we know very well where the road are, or almost very well, but we don't know where water is and we don't know how much water we have. And, and then we, we have also the predictors that in this case are global freshwater environmental variables. So I'm going to talk briefly about uh, this one and, uh, and then about uh, the second one, the, the predictor. So first of all, we need to map the stream network and, and the basin, okay? So uh, everything that you do it, uh, usually in spatial science, you can do in tiles. Most of the time, these, these tiles can be regular. So 20 by 20 degree and so on. But in my case, each single base, I need the information of the the full entire basin, okay? So each single, each single tile has to be include the, the full basin in order to understand where it's ending, okay? It's not a pixel level, but each single pixel need to know where is the other pixel come from, where is the other pixel close by, and especially where the water come from, okay? So, um, so I delineated basin, and we were able also to, um, to delineate also the, all the stream at 90 meter resolution. So this is just a zoom in uh, in one particular area in, uh, in Patagonia. And as you can see, you have quite detailed um, string network, even better, much better than OpenStreetMap. So OpenStreetMap is mapping um, string network, but doesn't come to the resolution that you can get in 90 meter. So at this moment, and probably most of you did already some, some uh, stream network delineation with the flow accumulation during your GIS classes and so on. So I use the same principle and techniques, but in a multi-core computation uh, for the massive data process. So it was from a software point of view and computation point of view was really challenging because you have to deal with big data and RAM. Mm -hmm. So the RAM, as I mentioned, even in HPC is not unlimited. So you need to be uh, point carefully how to do it and checking. Um, so then we, we have also, so we know where the stream are and we know also the global freshwater environmental variation, the so-called predictors. But in terms of streams, we need to be really careful because whatever we are going to map over here at the gauging station where you have our observation, so the amount of water that is, is present over here is influenced by the, the precipitation that is upping into the mountain. So if you take, like you always take, uh, for, a, for example, like Tom does for soil sampling, he take the information over there. But in, in my case, in, in a hydrological model, you have to take the upper stream contribution to understand the predictor over here. So we, we de develop a method that identify the, each single basin for each single cell and then you calculate the amount of water, in this case, precipitation, that are going inside to this basin and then attribute it to that cell. And you can, you can do the same kind of computation with the forest, okay? So amount of forest that is, come, is contributing to the, uh, to the water, amount of agriculture and so on. And as you can see, these predictors are really important. For example, this one is really important for all the nitrogen phosphate that yesterday Long Shan was mentioned. So at this point, we have a gauging station, we know where the stream are, 
and we know also all the predictors. So, and we are in the framework of implementing the machine learning. Okay, so I could not uh, present any work of the machine learning because we are still in the, in the process of this one that is really computational intensive. So probably will take one, one year of computation in the supercomputer TL. So it's really something. Uh, now I'm, I'm also talking with Richard Barnes to, to find some way to speed up his um, reach them software that has been also implemented and in, uh, in grass so i will use grass with rich them software so let's see if i can reduce maybe alpha year or something uh, so how i do this um, massive data uh, massive data integration so i i usually use uh, my really my work coding environment my gluing i call it my gluing language is the bash and the linux so a bit old-fashioned but it's still one of the most fast way to process data. And then from here, I, if I need geographic computation, I call GDAL, PK tools, and GRASS. If I need really passing text file, I use the old fashioned way, OK. OK. So it's really the most uh, efficient way to uh, uh, parsing text file or giga file or text file. So I, I use R for really for the statistical point of view. So I will use R for the machine learning, and maybe we will move also to Julia for the machine learning because we will have a very big data set. So I'm afraid that for the prediction is going to be uh, a bit uh, a bit long. So it was also good to to long all this way to interact and um, and see. So yes. So I think, yeah, I use I don't use Jupyter, I don't use uh, R Studio, I use old-fashioned way Emacs. Uh, so Emacs. is really Emacs is my uh, my environment for coding uh, for a simple reason because I can always log through the terminal without graphical user interface, and even through my my mobile phone I can log into the terminal. So I don't have delay. I've been using Lime. But again, it's very good when I'm at Yale, Lime, so in the research center, but as soon you go out, uh, I need to use Emacs. I don't use to write the script in my laptop and then send it to the, so I, I, I do everything in the HPC. So Emacs is, is still the fast way to, uh, is Emacs or VI, there are the two. Um, so this is really an example of uh, for example, for this paper in Nature Ecological Evolution that we did uh, two years ago, uh, potential dangerous consequences for biodiversity of solar engineering implementation and termination. So over here you can, oops, over here you can, can I click? Yes, you can see this script, for example, that um, has been behind the paper. Control plus. You can see behind the paper. So this is my um, Bash script where I call CDO climate data operator for net CDF operation. I use Oak for uh, creating a big matrix completely with one everywhere. Um, I call again uh, CDO for regression line into the into the uh, multidimensional temporal analysis. And also here I use PK set mask for masking this data filtering for change the aggregation um, and so on and whenever i could not find anything for example uh, uh, create random variables inside r i was using r so as you can see here you can nested r inside bash script in the same way you can nested python inside the bash script um, so uh, and then in the end you write a table and the typical way and you can also parallelize um, R, so launching different R job in a multi-core environment thanks to the XARC um, option for in Bash. So it's really a really um, funny way, but really complex because when you get the error, syntax error is a syntax error of Python, R, and Bash. So you have to know the different language to understand where the error comes from. So it's, it's really challenging in this aspect. So this is uh, how I work in my, in my environment with all the GDAL you can see and so on. 
So yeah, I, again, I enter in R with just with my table. And then from my table, I do the plotting, I do, um, um, I do the machine learning and so on. And, uh, and I also do the mapping in R. So I use it, uh, this fancy map that you see, of course they are being done in R, but I do it, for example, resampling everything in GDAL. So that one I did by 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer. And then the, my image become one mega, my raster of the globe. And then you can plot easily inside R. Um, so th this is where we are going to focus um, in the, during the workshop. So we are going to use the OSGO that I've been distributed through the USB. So please uh, ask me now if you want to follow and I will give you the USB. If you did it already and you still have the USB, please return to me in this way I can give to the other colleagues. Um, and we will focus, uh, of course, in the GDAL and PK tools as a single uh, command line and the language integration will come afterwards. I mean, afterwards by you, but I can point where are the, where are the page that I can, I can show you. So we, I think we have a few, few minutes for a question and discussion. And uh, yes, so over here. I do everything one. Yes. Uh, I, I really like to have a script, each single script for the, so the, for example, first script, downloading the data, second script, cropping and tiling, third script, processing the tiles. GDAL allocation info to create the table. I have my table in text file, I enter in graphs, in, sorry, in R. And I do the processing there. And then so, out. So the problem is like uh, in general, in our education, in Western education, more than the is different. Now, in our when I started to open, I realized that if I do unit selection, then you have to survive and also prepare it all, reduce it. So, uh, so we have this whole, there's a two together. Yes. And so, what do we get to do that? No. <laughs> Actually, we when we were working together, uh, me and Tom, we were open and we never had any course. <laughs> so you, you have to be lucky to, to have somebody teaching you because you shrink in the time of learning. Okay. So one week of learning by yourself, it can be explained by one hour of somebody tell you how to do it. So it's really appealing. And the DocuWiki Spatial Ecology Docnet is really uh, a source of information for these different language and integration. Um, and so uh, this is my summer school where our focus, our, we are focusing. Okay, so we are focusing really in the Linux environment. And then in according to your field and science, you can do machine learning, you can do ecology, you can do so on. So it's really, is, for me, it was very nice to combine the two summer school. So we, maybe we should talk to do a two-week summer school. <laughs> Benchmark. And then we uh, we know thank you DLC that we can have the post to show up just the general framework of the global programming of the general framework. And uh, we discovered that it's uh, one of the uh, four layers the four layers of the yeah that is now the moment of the course together. And uh, we were like, told to make a spot count so that it could be silly if anybody has to filter, pre filter, fix things, 
Okay, from, uh, from a computational perspective, it will not be so uh, problematic from a computational perspective because with the GDLPK tools, you can do a lot of stuff. It's, it's not uh, big issues. Uh, the problem is that at the moment, the 30 meter resolution is, is still a surface terrain model and not a, a, not a, uh, a terrain model. Um, so need to be corrected, 30 meter, need to be corrected for the tree height. Perfect. So taking out all the object, the tree height. Rather the merit has been correctly by this, um, uh, by this error, taking out the height of the tree and also uh, Dai Yamazaki released a merit hydro that has been hydrologically corrected. So for my purpose of hydrological modeling, so for the, second pro for the second project, I'm using that one to derive stream network. If I'm going to use the 30 meter, probably not at the moment until um, myself or somebody else decide to correct. Because if not, my stream is going to go ending in the motorway because the motorway are the most flat areas so where this, the water can go really easily. So they will not go in the valley, especially over here in super flat terrain, but will follow the motorway. So I will wait a couple of years probably until I'm able to use the 30 meter resolution for the stream network. Yeah. Um, so from the audience was asking, is Julia ready for geocomputation? Actually, this is something that Longju Shen, my colleague is checking. He uh, has been very advanced for the different library in the machine learning, so he's really proficient. Actually, we didn't check yet if he's ready to uh, embed TIFF data. Uh, probably yes, because they use it already. I was just reading, I didn't put my finger. They were using for image processing like identify a cat or a dog or the typical image analysis. So I think probably you will lose the geo information in the geo TIFF, so it will become a TIFF, but then you can bring back the geo information. So we are checking that pipeline, uh, but we didn't arrive yet in the modeling phase, so I will let you know in six months probably. <laughs> Call to send functions 
Yeah, so this is the case, for example, where I close R and before I could close R, I write out down my script, to, uh, sorry, my TIFF to the disk. So what, for example, uh, Tom was saying, without even C. I just see later on, maybe with another software. Creating them, yeah. Yes, so I take over. Yeah, please. How is the sound? Sound is good? Oh, yeah. There were some complaints about the sound by some online participants, so we do our best. Um, okay, so that was uh, uh, Giuseppe's talk. Now I will try to also motivate you to go to the other room in the morning and uh, also to come back here in the afternoon. Uh, so I, I have uh, two blocks that I will talk about and they can roughly please split into uh, ensemble machine learning for spatial prediction. And then the second block is uh, how do you do uh, geocomputing engineering? So how do you plan processing large data from importing data, formatting data uh, to running operations? Uh, so I finished uh, making my own tiling functions. I couldn't find anything. I uh, fit uh, exactly what I needed. So I made my own functions. So I made my own tiling functions and and then I um, started combining it with the GDAL uh, and then running this processing uh, piece by piece. And then I saw that, yeah, I, it's very flexible so I can really um, use all my knowledge of R programming and uh, then use it to do any type of raster operation. So that's the plan. Something about me, so I, I, I did a PhD in pedometrics. Uh, it's a cross field between uh, soil science and statistics. Um, and I was special interested in mapping. So I, uh, my uh, title of my thesis was pedometric mapping. Uh, but and then I also worked with the biodiversity data in Amsterdam, uh, the computational geocology group. Um, and I also worked with meteorological data. My f uh, first PhD student I supervised did a PhD on uh, interpolation of meteorological data. And, uh, and, and I work a lot, of course, with soil data. Um, in the last uh, 10 years, let's say, I uh, focused a lot on global data sets, so that's been my niche, uh, especially doing global uh, soil and vegetation mapping. Um, unfortunately, the funding for global project is uh, at the order of magnitude smaller than the funding for projects that you run for uh, wealthy countries. Uh, so it is, it is rough. Uh, for example, the open land map is still, we finance it out of own pocket, just so, you, just so you know, so we don't have any funding for it. Uh, so open land map is really our, um, uh, how do you put it, uh, own investment, yeah. Uh, so uh, then uh, Open Geo Hub, basically, uh, as you see, it, uh, we are quite uh, data uh, production driven. So we are not uh, primarily like, a, um, let's say, just uh, solving some software problems institute. We are primarily driven in uh, making the data, really. So we are data makers. Uh, but then if you want to make better data, you have to change the way you code. So then we also continue coding. So we do also, we're going to make uh, software and uh, we have funding to do that. So that's a good news. Um, what I specialized last uh, about uh, five, six years, I, I, I specialize a lot on uh, taking machine learning. And then at the, at the beginning, I was, so, as I said, I was very enthusiastic. I, I just started using blindly machine learning and I said, oh, I get a better R square. So yeah. I just skip all these linear models and things. Uh, but then um, uh, last five years, I started looking more critical in machine learning and actually focusing on things that don't work. Uh, and so you see that these things come also in this summer school. Uh, so that's the extrapolation problems and uh, then um, um, dealing with the uh, overfitting uh, and then also um, uh, uh, dealing with the computational problems. Um, so yeah, there's still lots of things to solve. And uh, I think um, eventually in science, as you get deeper and deeper in science, 
you with the objective to solve problems you just it's a worm of cans you know you just uh, more and more problems pop up but if you love science that's that's a good thing you know you discovered more more open issues and so it's a never-ending story um, this is my timeline so I, as i said in the pg at itc then i also uh, as giuseppe said i was at jfc sometime um, and we worked with, on the uh, european soil data center and then i moved to amsterdam 2007 uh, that was really right group for me and really uh, really appreciated um, all the things I learned there. Um, it was a, a group of the uh, Professor Willem Bouten. Uh, it was called uh, Computational Geoecology. Uh, so they, lots of things I, I, I really got inspiration there and, and especially looking at the how the GBIF uh, project is organized. Uh, and then uh, we had the project also for Netherlands called EcoGrid. Uh, and then in 2010, um, uh, colleagues called me to uh, come and help with the global soil data production. At the time, there was a project called Global Soil Map. Uh, so I moved to Wageningen uh, and I worked for Wageningen University at ISRIC. Um, and then, uh, and then in, in this period, about eight years, in, in about 2014, I started uh, making this global data set called Soil Grids. Uh, and I, um, you know, I, uh, I was inspired so much by GBIF that I started an initiative called GCIF. Uh, so one uh, famous scientist once said, um, a talent imitates genius steals. Uh, so yeah, so I took uh, a good idea. I said, oh, you do it in biodiversity, oh, we need it in soil. So I call it GCIF, Global Soil Information Facilities. Um, and so that I was pushing that. And then uh, in 2018, we, uh, we went independent and uh, started this uh, Open Geo Hub. We also have a company called Envirometrics uh, Company. We do um, we do uh, consulting and we can do also help uh, produce commercial data sets and services. And Open Geo Hub is not for profit. It's really foundation. It's like the summer school. We don't generate any profit. We don't have, uh, well, this year we'll even have a bit of uh, losses, but um, it's really uh, just meant to uh, um, so there's no intention to compete with anything. It's really just uh, ideas just to enable people and to help, especially young research, find that software and find that paper and find that path, you know, that will uh, really help you make the best science. So that's really the main idea of the summer schools. Uh, that's me on Google Scholar, if you can trust Google Scholar. I think it, it does work, uh, Google Scholar. I think it's the right way to do it also is to automate it. Uh, so they automatically export all the citations and, and um, you see I have this paper on uh, regression Krieging. Uh, it's still uh, my most cited paper and then the second one is the soil grids. Um, this one, the soil grids, I think we get something like um, uh, almost like uh, 100 to 200 citations a year. Uh, so that's, uh, that's what happens when you, you make a, a, something not for yourself but you make data for people and you um, you document it and you also make functionality for people, then people tend to use it as they use it, they cite you. Um, but that wasn't my motivation. I mean, I didn't make, I didn't make soul grids because I wanted to, a uh, lot of citations that it's not my kick. Um, I just really wanted lots of people to use it. Um, and so when you look at the, um, look at the, uh, the map, there's, uh, I think 130,000. Uh, visitors uh, downloading and using data it's all around the world so this was really my dream come true because I really wanted to uh, make something like a Wikipedia for soil data um, and uh, eventually my more and more my uh, uh, my measures of success are really just uh, a number of people using things and a number of people being really uh, finding the data set useful um, uh, so Open Geo Hub, we, we started jointly, um, Ishani, Bob and me, uh, we had a couple of discussions and we first we said, well, we, we did the summer schools for like 10 years and um, I never had any, you know, it was very difficult with uh, organizing everything, we never had a bank account or anything. So we said, well, let's professionalize it, let's make it really professional, so it means that, you know, we, uh, we have all the accounts and we have a legal, um, uh, legal uh, uh, representative, etc. And so we started the uh, Open Geo Hub, and then we were not thinking, you know, that because we called it a non-for-profit foundation, uh, so we thought that we will do more work to company. So the, you know, the company is like commercial, and you know, you can uh, do huge projects. 
uh, but so what happened is we also apply for some project and we have a crazy now uh, success rate. I think it's almost 60% of the project we apply, we win. Uh, so, so we got these uh, big projects and, um, and I'm super happy. So one, one big project we got, uh, it's by the uh, Innovation Networking Agency, INEA. Uh, it's called GeoHarmonizer. And uh, specifically, we will try to make uh, uh, open data for Europe. So uh, we will take a couple of uh, projects where the data is there already, uh, but it's not fully harmonized and hasn't been uh, boosted, you know, with the best uh, machine learning. Uh, so we will take this data and uh, we will try to improve it. And then the other project is called Mood. Um, and this is a Horizon project. It's almost 50 million euro project. Uh, it's on uh, modeling outbreak of diseases. Uh, not, not specifically, it wasn't specifically for coronavirus, it was pre-coronavirus, so we didn't know it's going to happen. But of course, now we look also at the coronavirus data and, uh, and especially this uh, MOOD project, it's about, uh, also about spatial analysis of this data uh, and also modeling this um, uh, and predicting what will happen with diseases uh, as effect of climate change. So how the Europe will look in uh, 2030, 2050. Um, and just to give you an idea, just quickly, I opened this uh, one. I actually already mentioned that. Um, so this is for the for the geoharmonizer. One of the things we are looking at is uh, to compile for the whole uh, Europe all the uh, point data on three species, um, and then uh, use that data because this data is, is kind of exists in different repositories. Uh, so we compile the data. It's now three million points here. Um, and uh, compiled kindly by the Johannes uh, Heisig. Um, so we, we take this point data and now we have 30 meter covariates for all of Europe uh, and we can go on and, and, and do that uh, modeling, uh, use some uh, newest uh, machine learning and then fine tune the models, boost the accuracy and then produce the best uh, possible uh, potential natural vegetation maps of Europe. So that's one of the one of the little uh, segments of, of the geoharmonizer. Um, so my, as you see, my gen my general interest can be grouped in these three around these three topics more or less. When you when you talk like just from the scientific point of view, so that's the Earth data cubes. Um, and here we make we do some global projects. Also, we have now funding for one global project. So I'm happy about that. But as I said, it's, I was I'm quite surprised. It's so difficult to get funding for global. It's uh, easy to get the funding for US, Europe, and a couple of wealthy countries, but very difficult to get uh, funding for global. Uh, but we got one global project. So we, we are compiling now these Earth Data Cubes, uh, so global data sets. And Leandro was showing you the same DVI, if you remember the time series. Um, so that's something also very exciting. Uh, then uh, machine learning for spatial data. Uh, so we, uh, we want to solve uh, lots of problems you see in this summer school. We do want to solve them. So uh, extrapolation problems, uh, overfitting, bias, um, then um, uh, computational efficiency. So we want to solve them. And we are really now engineering really machine learning. So we, uh, we invest about 50,000 just now on uh, computing infrastructure. So we have our own computing infrastructure and uh, we want to turn, we had some projects that will compute like one or two weeks to deliver the data. And now we would like to turn that, that we can compute and deliver projects within two days. Uh, it's kind of a rule of time will be to have the things overnight. Uh, so any, any computing when you do, when you get the results overnight, it's the most efficient because, uh, you know, some part of the day you cannot work, so you have to sleep. So you leave the computer to the work. Uh, but if you compute like two weeks, I know this is, uh, it's a cumbersome. It's a, uh, it's very stressful also as you make some uh, um, little mistake in a code. I had a few times to make a little typo in the code or I forgot to load some package and I would just lose two weeks, you know? And so it's a really pain, it really hurts. You have to trash the data and um, so, and then the third topic uh, very interesting is the, for us, it's this uh, idea of like organizing communities. So not just, you know, in a, I think in a kind of linear thinking, you, you always think like, okay, this is our group, uh, you know, we have the hierarchical decision making and, and we have a project we deliver, uh, but I'm very interested in organizing community and then having a community where, you know, people either volunteer or do inside their own projects, but it works. 
uh, and it's diff very difficult to get people to work in a community. It's really, really challenging. Um, but if you do manage to organize people, uh, and so like the way that, for example, the Crown is organized uh, in, um, for example, Wikipedia, and many of the projects, they, they, you know, there's a proof of success, but to organize people, it's very difficult. I underestimate the, the effort to organize people uh, to work smoothly without conflicts, without uh, multi-million uh, euro projects and things. Uh, but it, it can be done. I, I do look at the good examples and, um, and we are hoping to establish a couple of projects where uh, they will be based on uh, uh, live communities and, and they will eventually leave what we, lead to what we call collective intelligence. Uh, so that's a, a self-organized uh, group of people which are able to complete the task and make sure the system runs. Uh, that's my evolution in the in geostatistics. I, I, I was very enthusiastic in 1999. I saw this Krieging geostatistics, very enthusiastic. Uh, and then I did that in my thesis a bit. Uh, I wanted to improve that and I did this regression Krieging. Um, and um, and that, so and then when you publish something and you see this is still my most cited work. So when you Google regression Krieging, you most likely find me. So people tell me like, oh, you're the regression Krieging guy. Uh, so, you know, that's what happened in science. You get identified with some weird uh, uh, abstract term uh, that becomes your meme. Um, but uh, uh, so they will say, you're the regression green guy. But uh, then uh, in about uh, 2014, I, I, first time I, I do random forest and we were doing uh, soil maps of Africa. And then we, when I saw, okay, let's look at other, then I look at this XG boost and support vector machines. Then we did the global data. And so eventually in like about 2018 or something, I, I, I saw that you can replace, uh, um, you know, geostatistics with machine learning. I mean, literally replace. So you, you do also spatial dependence, you incorporate spatial dependence, anything. And, um, and then also I saw that this machine learning, it just, it just different models, but what's very interesting is ensembling, ensembling uh, techniques. Um, and then I started doing the also global and first space, then space time. So that's kind of evolution. Uh, but yeah, it's funny in science, uh, you, there's always a gap of uh, the delay. So people t still tell me, you're the regression cream guy. And I say, well, I, last time I used regression cream was in 2017 or something or, or 2016. So I, I don't really use it. So no, I'm not the regression cream guy. <laughs> yeah. So uh, this is the, the uh, so when you do like a, a universal cream in, in GR, um, on the left, and this is the random forest, but you incorporate spatial distances. So you can see that the spatial dependent structure is about the same. Um, but here you had to fit the variogram and you had to pick up some parameters. And here it's just poof, automatic. It was a bit scary how much you can automate with machine learning. Um, but so if you want to learn about this, uh, especially spatial interpolation using machine learning, so then please come to the next block, the, the one that starts at 11. And so I'll be talking about um, how do you automate spatial interpolation using machine learning. Uh, then this, the second topic is uh, also connected to a global project open land map um, uh, where we, uh, you know, we want to put, uh, so the same thing as the open street map, it's just, we want to make it, so open street map is about, you know, urban areas and uh, towns and roads and like, so like a topo map. Um, and we are interested really like the soils and vegetation and um, uh, biodiversity, uh, climate, etc. So we wanted to make something like this. Uh, so for environmental data for the land mask for the world. Um, and then we realized, okay, we have to change the way we program and we have to uh, be more efficient in computing. And so the second block will be uh, more focused on um, more focused on processing this uh, large stacks. Uh, of rasters and doing this geocomputing engineering. And I will show you the many paths and you can see it sometimes is confusing. Uh, I mean, how confusing uh, can it get? For example, Robert Hyman's registered domain R spatial, uh, Edzo Pebez my registered domain R spatial. I don't think it can be more confusing than that. Uh, so you go and you look at it, okay, what is this? Which one do I use? And then they make a, a package and then they decide to make a new package. So uh, Robert Hammonds had the, the uh, raster package. Now that he makes sta uh, the Terra package. And then as they had uh, SP and now, and then they had space time and now they have SF. 
and so the things also um, yeah things uh, in open source are free to you know make as many packages as you like and so what i'll try to do in the second block uh, help you with these parts and uh, and show you what are the differences and what you should consider as uh, maybe a better part for your data analysis uh, because some parts they are faster uh, they're faster they're more efficient they have you have more flexibility um, this is the the type of servers we now buy they have a 400 gig ram and 80 threads and you see i run a r studio in the back and around uh, yes yeah you can see it uh, that's a uh, so i like to show this because you buy a machine this is like a ferrari you could say it costs ten thousand euros um it's a it's a server but you put ubuntu and you can access um so you see i, I use almost all of the ram and all of the cores and so um, not wasting any anything uh, it also has a four terabit ssd so also the reading and writing i can make lots of little tiles i can make like hundred thousand tiles um, and if you put it with ssd it's very efficient if you use something else it wouldn't be it would be 10 times less efficient so a uh, combination of ssd a lot of ram and uh, good chips, uh, the most expensive of the chips, by the way, ch chips and uh, RAM. So I know some of you like Mac, but for me, it's uh, that science fiction to buy a Mac computer because uh, when I look at the chips and the RAM, it's, uh, you know, really expensive. Uh, so these servers you buy, literally you pay 90% of funds is just the uh, chips and RAM. I think just the chips are 60% of the cost. Um, so, so this thing you see here that, that that's what we're making the open land map so the data you see in open land map the temperatures the uh, soil properties vegetation maps uh, that's all made uh, using this uh, system and um, uh, when i started doing the processing with r people told me ah you know r is not it's not for like really operational work it's not for big data uh, you know, it has RAM problems and they, they told me lots of stuff, but um, I was stubborn and I just pushed it and and eventually we, we proved it. So you see it, it works. We can fully parallelize it. We use everything uh, to full capacity and uh, we can make data. Now we can make a global prediction at 200, 1500 meter uh, per one variable within uh, 48 hours. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and this is ensemble machine learning. So we do three models. Uh, so we really proved it. Um, uh, okay, this ensemble approach, very interesting. Uh, so it's a really different uh, uh, mindset, you know, when you think about ensembling. It's, so it's not about uh, just picking up a single method or just promoting like a one way you, to do it, but you say, well, these are just uh, different designs, you know, like support vector machine, as I told you, random forest, these are different designs. So I don't question whether you should do support vector machine or or uh, random forest or something else or the lasso uh, but um, what's important is that uh, you in the ensembling culture that you say well how do i pick up a best combination um, and that's called uh, there's a, a chapter in this book uh, that i shared it's called about stacking models and so one one uh, way to stack models that i find very interesting is that you you call, you produce a so-called meta learner uh, so that's a, a, again a model that uh, decides how to distribute the weights to do the uh, the weighted average um, and you can even use for that you can use a complex or more simple models i tend to use a simple models like just a linear regression or something uh, but then you you do lots of computing to do that to try to do that objectively so there's a lots of cross validation um, and then you get this uh, ensembling and one of the algorithms i really like is a group uh, from berkeley made this uh, algorithm called super learner uh, so it, uh, it's a bit uh, it penalizes uh, learners which are weak uh, so you distribute the weights only to the strongest learners uh, and this, this is the one i like uh, this idea of ensembling so, so here you have for example three data sets uh, so there's the uh, chelsea climate there's the um, i merge uh, 10 kilometer and there's the sm2 rain also 10 kilometer and there's also world claims. So there's multiple data sets. So that just, and it's the same thing. This is, I think, October. Uh, so, um, so it's a 30 year uh, precipitation map for October. And you see some data sets they have, uh, they cover also oceans. Uh, and then some data sets cover only land. Some data sets only go to the 60 degrees north. 
Um, and so the, the question is, uh, normally as a data scientist, you say, well, I don't, I don't need a tree, you know, I don't need all these data sets. I just want to <laughs> give me the best estimate. I just want to know October precipitation. And so that's where the ensemble comes. And so in, in assembling, then you, you combine all three data sets and then you, uh, uh, you, you take the best out of uh, all of them. So uh, some data set covers the ocean. So you take the ocean data. Uh, some data set is one kilometer, one is 10 kilometers. So you downscale to one kilometer. And then some data set has a bit higher accuracy in some part of the area and the other data in the other part. And so ideally the ensemble helps you uh, do that. So I posted that on Twitter and uh, it's not my field really, the, you know, ensembling uh, rainfall data and stuff, but I, I spent maybe one day processing this. And, and this is, um, uh, you know, paradoxically, this is my most uh, um, influential tweet uh, because uh, there's a high interest in rainfall. So I just put the data on Zenodo and I sent this. I never made any paper. It just really literally cost me one day to do this. And so, and now when I look at my Twitter, that's my most famous tweet. Uh, yeah, but it's funny. Uh, that's another zoom uh, just to show you. Uh, so this is the I emerge 10 kilometer and SM2 rain. Um, and then we are this Chelsea climate one kilometer, right? So you have these three data sets and then this will be the ensemble. Uh, as you see, you fill in all the gaps, but there are problems. I mean, you still have the cross between land and uh, a sea, you know, you can have a jump in values. So there are still, there are still problems, but still this is this data set I posted on Zenodo and, and people now use it. Uh, is the best estimate. The other thing which is very interesting is mapping uh, potential natural vegetation. Uh, so that's something that is a, a long-term interest and actually we would like to find uh, uh, funding actually for this. It's just, it's, as I said, it's not easy, um, but we are starting now through geoharmonizer. We're doing a European map of potential natural vegetation. Um, and basically this idea of, uh, so if you haven't heard it, there's a paper you can read about this. But uh, the idea is that you, in the past, you had, a, a, of course, much more forest. Uh, and you see these, these red things, all the forests we converted, uh, well, we, I mean, the human species uh, converted into uh, agriculture and has been uh, cut down or used for logging. Um, so you see there's a huge areas. And so now the, the question is, you know, if you would like to go back to that, so that's the, that's the estimated difference on the left, the estimated difference as historic and current. Uh, and you see that's a huge area. I mean, uh, uh, lots of Africa, Asia, Latin American tropics. Um, so now the question is, could, if you would like to go back, where do you go and how do you do it objectively? And I think data science is the solution for that. Uh, so we take this uh, pollen uh, analysis data from the soil, um, and then we know this historic, historic species, and then we run data uh, machine learning, and we test different algorithms, uh, performance accuracy, in this case, Ranger again comes as the best. And then we made this map and that's the map. We call it uh, Earth without people also. So we make these maps of uh, planet uh, with the fully uh, natural vegetation. Uh, we did the same thing with the 100 meter uh, resolution. Well, we couldn't process now. We, we had a limited budget, so we could make the 100 meter. But this is the land cover map of the world at 100 meter, the newest map uh, produced by Vito, uh, something that Danius was also presenting. Uh, so what we did, we take uh, just the natural vegetation, it's about 70,000 points, uh, and then we run machine learning, and then we make this, this is US, and you can see the US uh, with and without people. Uh, so all this uh, pink is the agriculture, also cities are red, uh, so all the cities will disappear, of course. And, and you see it's a quite a good result because you see these edges, edges of natural vegetation, they are kind of in the same place, uh, but we, we fill in all the places where uh, you, um, you will uh, have uh, uh, nat native vegetation back. Um, and then this one, this map is also available through um, naturemap.earth. Um, we look at the forestry species now and uh, we look at the European forestry species. And we did, a, uh, initially we did a one kilometer, the, uh, so you see here, it's like some potential natural vegetation. Um, and you can compare them. Uh, so this is the potential, this is the actual this is from the forest uh, atlas uh, of Europe uh, produced by JRC. Um, no, sorry, this is actually from a paper by Bruce et al. But they uh, did it for a European project. So they just mapped the, where the Fagus luatica is at the moment. Uh, and then this one is the same, so you same, same scale, you know, same probability. And we get, of course, much, uh, much more potential for the, uh, but for every pixel, we can know what is the uh, probability of occurrence. 
uh, given the just the ecological conditions. Um, so I finish with that. Uh, this is my favorite quote. Um, no doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. This is a, also a motto for Open Geohub. So we are a small organization, but uh, we think we uh, have some good ideas and we would like to chase them. So please, yes, join me in the, uh, in the uh, first block will be automated mapping, how to use machine learning for special population. And in the second block, it will be how to process large rasters and how to do a geocomputing geocompute, geo engineering. And I went a bit over time, I apologize, but uh, we have some time for questions if you have. These are mainly the people that wanted to join the summer school, but they couldn't do it because of the Corona crisis. Um, yes, if there are any questions. Yes. Yes. It, it, yes. Um, it's a. It's a. It can get uh, complex, but uh, this is the main plot. Let me see. Um, that's the main plot. So you have this, uh, let's say, four type of vegetation. So there's the the actual uh, actual vegetation, the the natural and managed, and you have the potential uh, natural and potential managed. Um, so um, if you take, for example, Europe, uh, you could take uh, only the the protected areas, so like national parks, and let's say they still have this uh, native vegetation species. Uh, and then you overlay them uh, on ecological parameters. So the climatic parameters, landscape parameters, terrain parameters, soil, geology, etc. Just, just purely ecological space. Then you overlay these points and you fit the models. And let's say the models are uh, like, um, uh, so the R square is high or, or the kappa is high. So you have like 90%. Um, that means that you, very, you have very, you know, clearly what is the relationship uh, with between species and their distribution. And then you just apply that model over whole of uh, Europe. And then it fills it's all, all the cities, all the gaps, yes? And it creates that uh, potential uh, vegetation image. Uh, of course, it's not the historic, that's a different from historic. And historic is the, uh, the actual past uh, vegetation. So that's, a, that's where people get a bit confused. The potential vegetation is not the historic. You could also say, I want to map the historic vegetation. Uh, then you need like a pollen data, et cetera. Um, and then it's about reconstructing how the world looked like. Then, then it's about making uh, this image uh, here I showed you. Um, sorry. Um, uh, where they compared the, yeah, this one here. So, so then it's about making this, uh, this map, which is uh, uh, assumed historical distribution. Now it's a difficult, we don't know anymore, like 2000 years, you know, we don't know if every pixel uh, where was the forest and you really, it's a really detective work to make. Uh, but uh, potential vegetation is again, just like hypothetical vegetation where it's about, uh, so what we are proposing basically that one pixel, uh, we would like to say, look, we think a model so significant and we think if you want to do land restoration or you have to want to rebuild vegetation, we think that these species, they will have a highest chance of survival. And that, that's what we want to support, yes. Yes, nature protection areas, or we can take also historic data. So like a pollen analysis data, and that also because it shows you, but then you have to match it with the climate in the past and things. But let's say if you do that uh, past data, you can still train and then you apply that model uh, to the uh, future climate or current climate. And again, you, you can map then the, what could be a potential vegetation. Yes, Mate. Yes, no, no, I agree. It's, um, I wish, you know, I had a couple of projects where they requested that we do the reconstruction of the past. And then I tell them, okay, where's the data? Uh, I mean, I cannot build a time machine to travel in the past. You know, we just, we don't have the data. So then we say, well, what will be your, the best approach? I mean, what's the best that you can do with the data you have? And sometimes you're left with a situation like that. You, it's not, 
that you can design. I mean, we, obviously we cannot make a travel machine to go in the past and collect soil samples or uh, make pictures, you know, of the, or, or do some ground observation. Uh, so you, it's a bit of, it's a bit like forensics. It's like forensics, yes. It's like you have little pieces and you need to reconstruct the story um, and you, you try to come as close as possible to the reality. Yes? Yes, uh, at the moment, many people, what they tell me, like when I started doing this, was just like as a data scientist, I see all these data sets and okay, let's just run and see what happens. Uh, but now uh, people tell me actually that's not for like for the nature conservation projects and forestry. Uh, you know, this is uh, half, half information so that they cannot use it. But they say if you could estimate survival rate of the species, that's what they said. You need to estimate because with the survival rates, it's not about some ecological condition because you can have, it's this Liebig's law, you can have 15 ecological conditions, they're fine, and one is deadly. You know, you can have like a frost in the March or something. And so you need to estimate, uh, and maybe it can be done with machine learning also, that you estimate the survival rates. And sometimes it will be zero survival rate because there's events that happen that just clear. Um, and so that's what we are now looking at. That will be a part, I think, where we, will, we could data, make the data more usable. And we definitely want to do that. We don't need just the nature papers and I don't know. We really want to have data used for land restoration. Yes, yes. No, as I said, it's, it's a complex and this uh, sketch I told you, it's also, uh, so the different type of vegetation mapping, there's the historic reconstruction of vegetation for different periods. Uh, then there's the potential hypothetic vegetation. So there's, it's a, it's a complex thing. It's much more complex than I started first time. Now I'm just learning about, oh, wow, it's really complex. <laughs> uh, but uh, there is pieces of data. And if you're a good data scientist, and if you get the best uh, also historic data you can find, you can do like in forensics with uh, just few little traces you can reconstruct it is possible okay uh, we need to stop you need to get some coffee refilled uh, please 11 o'clock here uh, giuseppe in the other room uh, i'll be talking about machine learning for spatial manipulation thank you mm -hmm.